Time is so precious. Um, sorry, but it's me again. I'm, I'm chairing <laughs> the, the second panel. Um, we have two presenters. The first uh, is uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Juan Weixiu, um, who is a visiting faculty member at the Taiwan Research Institute of Waseda University. So because of lack of time, without further ado, can we first hear from uh, Dr. Juan, please. The floor is, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Professor Takahara, for your kind introduction. And let me express my deep appreciation for Ms. Ms. Bonnie Gleiser and CSIS for giving me, giving me such a great opportunity for my presentation today. And, and please, please allow me to introduce myself first. My name is Wei Xiu Huang. I'm from Taiwan. I have been studying in Japan since 2003, but studying Japanese since five years ago. My research specialty is the Melon Policy Decision Making Process of Taiwan. I published my own, my own works in Japan in the past. Today is my first time to present my work in English. Where can you give me some comments? Next, please. My topic is melon policy decision making process and the party alternation in Taiwan, especially f focus focus on the operation of National Security Council or NSC. In the in introduction, I explained my purpose and hypothesis lead by hypothesis. Li Tenghui visited to the US, United States in 1995, but Mellon thought that the visit was least effort for Taiwan independence, so conduct military exercise to intimidate Taiwan. After the third Taiwan Strait crisis, the close strait relations to once again become a significant security crisis that could potentially involve the United States and Japan for the, for the first time since the Cold War. However, after Chen Shui-bian, who supports Taiwan independence, won the presidential election, he promoted several provocative Melon policies, but did not declare Taiwan independence. Therefore, the party alternation in Taiwan is an important research topic for international po politics in Eastern Asia. Next, please. <laughs> and my my hyp hypothesis of this paper proposes that during the party alternation, the NSC oper operations ma maintain the stability of Taiwan's melon policy to a certain ex extent. NSC not only play a key advisory and lateral communications role in melon policy, but also an important channel for the president, president to make decisions. And because not only the government operational experiences, but also the quality and quantity of, of personnel in the Chen Shui-bian administration were far from those of the Li administration. It would be difficult for Chen Shui-bian to continue with Li Tenghui's operation model. Although Ma, Ma Yingzhou re retained Li and Chen staffs, we can uh, unable to observe <laughs> observe con con continuity in his po po policy and personnel through his public statement because Ma criticized Chen Shui Bian continuously. Next, please. Uh, I, I have analyzed the uh, announced analyzed the operation of. Taiwan's melon policy decision-making process in my book. 
the first chapter of this paper, of my paper is a simple summary of my book. Um, next, please. <laughs> and please see the figure one. AUC has stopped it fun functioning in 2006, but since 1990, it is the official framework of Taiwan's mainland policy decision-making process. However, the, this framework encountered the problem of ambiguous inter-organizational inter -organi relations and resulted in conflicts between SEF and MAC. And next, please. And Li Denghui consider, considered that those problems should be solved through the uh, condition coordination and integration in higher level. So, therefore, he started to operation NSC since 1996. But there are also many problems about the decision-making process in NSC. For example, many researchers think, think that the president cannot involve in the decision-making process by NSC because according to the Constitution, the premier is the head of government in ROC. Finally, Li Tenghui made some in informal meeting, meetings to in instead of the formal NSC meeting. And next, please. And I, I have turned this formula, the NSC formula, in my book and conduct some case studies. The relation between Li Tenghui and all meetings are shown in figure two and figure three. And next, please. The goals will be pensioned. The Gu Wang meeting in 1998 and the special state-to-state -state relationship and re related ma management actions after the least declaration were all the outcomes from this formula. But the decision-making process for mainland policy still caused confusion from time to time. For example, Li Tenghui announced the ghost law be pension and the special state-to-state -state relationship without consulting the executive yuan. The main cost the main cost was um, was that the NSC formula relied on Li Tenghui's personal relationship to complacent for the de defects of the de decision making um, framework. Therefore, after Chen Shui winning the election. He had, had had to convert the operation formula relay on Li Tenghui's personal leadership. Next, please. And in chapter two, I analyze um, Chen Shui-bian administration. Please see the table one and table two in my handouts because the table is too long. I cannot um, write it in my PPT. And from the pers personnel affairs of Chen Shui-bian administration, we can find that not only Chen Shui-bian administration, but also from Li, Li to Chen administration, the personnel affairs of mainland policy maintained a certain stability. I, always, I also analyzed the operation of the Chen, Chen Shui-bian administration's mainland policy decision-making process. The NSC admin, ad, advisory system and operation formula of mainland policy decision-making in Chen administration was finally completed in the terms of Kang Ningxiang and Chou Yiren. Next, please. And Kang Ningxiang not only forbade ad advisory members for, from bypassing the secretary, secretary general to report the president directly. 
Next, please. And, but also co consolidate policy recommendations with his uh, amendments. Next, please. And additionally, Kang Inxiang also established the coordination mechanism. And next, please. And finally, Cho Yi Ren continued to ad adopt this system after 2004. I also make case study about the long-term policy and provocative policy. And KNT always criticized the economic exchange policy between Taiwan and the mainland during Chen administration is closed door policy. However, provocative open open up effective management policy was in fact, fact, a more open policy than go slow be pension. The Chen administration also continued to hold secret talks with the mainland to for, 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 for further pro promote the three links. And second is the amendment of the NSC organic law. Mm, this is a long-term issue since since the administration. Eventually, the amendments were passed by way of a proposal from the opposition parties. And next, please. And the announcement of the one, one country on each side, the uh, Announcement of the 2004 refer referendum in 2003 and ceasing function of NUC in 2006 were all regarded as in enforced policy that represented President Chen's attempts to change the static quo between Taiwan and the mainland. However, these three cases were not entirely similar. Uh, one, one country on each side was announced by Chen Shui-bian unilaterally with prayer consultation with the NSC, whereas for, for the announcement of of the implementation of the 2004 referendums and published NUC, President Chen had consulted the view of the NSC but did not accept the, the objection. Next, please. This case could, could be seen not as the non functioning of the NSC during the Chen administration, but rather as President Chen broke, broke the decision-making formula by himself. Next, please. In chapter four, I analyzed the Ma Yingzhou administration, and please see table four in my handout. Ma Yingzhou retained several staff members for from the Li and Chen administration in his first term. And Ma Yingzhou uh, also successfully, successfully promoted the three links and signed ECFA, e Economic Exchange uh, ECFA. The, the mainland policy promoted by Ma did not deviate, deviate from the past di direction. Next, please. And however, Ma, but most most policies in Ma in the Ma administration were promoted by a few of Ma's confidence called Ma Group. This formula has resulted in poor in internal con con coordination. In the case study of the signing of the close. Uh, co Cross Trade Service Trend Agreement, CSSTA, 
and Ma, Ma administration did, did not do enough internal con coordination in the administration, but also did not perform a, a assessment of the overall impact in the advance. The Ma administration even had not commu communicate with the printing traditional medicine and beauty salon industrialists before the negotiating and signing the CSSA. So the CSSA could not secure dom domestic trust. And next, please. And my my conclusion in this paper is simple. In, in terms of establishing the institution for exchange between Taiwan and the mainland, there were many similar similarities in the over, overall policy in Li Tenghui, Chen Shui-bian, and Ma ying administration. However, the operation of the NSC is dependent on the president's personal qualities, which led the instability in the Mellon policy decision-making process. Any party or even for, even for a new president from the same party comes to the power. The priority has always been, been to adjust the operation formula of the decision-making process and has no time to change the policy he made it policy first. And so the most pressing matter for any new president is not to change or promote Melon policy, but rather to building a stable decision-making operation formula. And thank you for your attention and listening my poor English. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wan. I would say that was a good, good debut in Washington, D.C. And now we turn to our distinguished uh, commentator, uh, Mr. David Brown, whom I'm sure you are very much familiar with. He's now an uh, adjunct professor um, at the uh, Paul Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies. Please. Thank you, Professor. And I'd like to thank the uh, <coughs> sponsors for giving me uh, an opportunity to participate in this panel, particularly uh, Bonnie Glazer. Uh, Professor Wong as a, is a very careful and thorough uh, student of uh, the role of the National Security Council and other bureaucratic structures in Taiwan's uh, policy making. And uh, since that is not my personal field of, of endeavor, I have uh, benefited a great deal from reading his paper. And I have uh, read the draft of his paper, which has not been available uh, to you. It's more compli complex uh, and sophisticated uh, than he has been able to present in a few minutes of uh, oral presentation. It looks, uh, his paper looks very deeply into the legal basis of the NSC, how that has changed uh, over time, uh, its internal structure, he talks a great deal about the personnel who have been in it at different times and the procedures under which they work and their relationship to other agencies in a uh, quite sophisticated fashion. Uh, and he digs deeper in to try and understand within these structures how the individual personal relationships between people in the NSC and the president and other players have affected policy makers and has managed to do this over the course of about uh, 20 years of modern Taiwan history, uh, bridging three very different presidents, uh, Li, Chun, and Ma. His paper also talks about the role of the MAC and the F uh, and uh, the Straits Exchange Foundation, uh, analyzes uh, some of the difficulties, as he says, on how uh, coordination of the services trade agreement ran into problems and even talks to a certain extent about how the current uh, National Security Council Gen Secretary General Jin Pusong's uh, individual activities have sort of gone beyond the normal mandate uh, of that office. So it's a quite detailed 
uh, exploration of uh, the NSC as a institution, as I said, from which I learned. Now his basic thesis he, he, he did put up on a slide, and that is that the NSC as a institution helped maintain stability in cross-strait policy during these two very important transfers of uh, political leadership in 2000 uh, when Chen Shui-bian took office and in 2008 when Pres President Ma Ying-jeou came into office. And he is trying to evaluate uh, the role of the NSC in maintaining stability and his uh, conclusion in the way he framed the question was that it did provide stability to a certain extent, i.e. Uh, a limited role. Uh, the evidence he presents to support this conclusion is partly uh, the overall institutional structure of the way the NS, uh, of the way man mainland policy is made, and that is with the NSC as a coordinating body at the top, the mainland affairs uh, council within the executive yuan and the Straits Exchange Foundation as an implementing body uh, at an unofficial level. Uh, the other evidence he presents is uh, to look carefully at what people uh, were put in place at the beginning of President Chen's first administration and the people that President Ma used uh, at the beginning of his uh, first term as well. And he sees a degree of continuity uh, in these people and believes that uh, that continuity of personnel uh, was what contributed to this certain degree of role that the NSC played in maintaining stability. Now I have a few comments on this. And the first is that he's tackling a very complicated uh, question, uh, complicated in the sense that there was, uh, in some ways, a bit of continuity between Li Deng Wei's policies at the end of his administration and Chen Shui-bian's policies in the first few years. And there was a bit of uh, continuity in terms of the first things the Ma administration did when it came in to office. It, was, it picked up on some of the discussions that had been held informally at the end of the Chen administration on uh, tourism and on uh, expanding uh, the very limited number of cross-strait flights that existed. And those were the first things uh, that Ma was able to implement. So he is correct in saying that there is some continuity there. But broadly speaking, uh, the Chen administration represented a very significant break in policy, particularly uh, after 2002, uh, when Chun uh, got over the doubts uh, uh, that existed about how he could manage cross-strait relations in his first year in office. And there very clearly was a break in policy uh, between the end of Chun Shui-bian's administration and the policies that President Ma has pursued. So, uh, trying to sort out uh, in this complex picture of some limited continuity but major change, what role uh, the NSC as a bureaucracy played, uh, I think was a challenging undertaking uh, for Mr. Wong. Uh, my personal uh, perspective on this is that uh, his paper and in fact his research area uh, places more weight on the institutional factors influencing policy than is warranted. I tend to look at these issues in terms of uh, political dynamics uh, that uh, examines a range of factors and uh, not to place the institutional emphasis on it that he does. Uh, from my uh, perspective, uh, the major thing that maintained a degree of stability uh, uh, in 2000 when Chen took office was the fact that he, in, in his uh, first inaugural address he enunciated the four 
no policy, which was designed to assure uh, Beijing, Washington, and uh, his domestic audiences that he, his ascension to the presidency was not going to produce confrontation, conflict almost Im immediately. How did that uh, four no's come about? Uh, it was primarily a matter of negotiation between the campaign staff uh, around President Chun and uh, the Americans as to what could be put in there would, that would be reassuring. And to the extent that I understand it, uh, the NSC as an institution did not play a role uh, in this. And secondly, if I look at the transition in 2008 and try and understand why stability uh, came about after a period of considerable tension, I would say that the most important factor was the election in 2008. The voters of Taiwan made two important decisions. They decided not to approve uh, Chen Shui-bian's proposed referendum on joining uh, the UN as Taiwan, and that was very reassuring to Beijing. And secondly, they elected a president who had a dramatically different policy uh, cap encapsulated in uh, Ma's uh, three no's, no unification, no independence, and no use of force uh, in cross-strait uh, relations. So I think that the, these uh, political factors were more important than the institutional. I'm not saying the institution had nothing to do with it, but it had, I think, a quite limited role. He, P Professor Huang is quite uh, straightforward in saying that each of the presidents he looked at was responsible for making uh, cross-strait policy and exercised that in a individual, personal way uh, that often, uh, particularly uh, in Li Wei's administration and in Chen Shui-bian's administration, uh, used groups outside the National Security Council as the uh, vehicles for coordinating policy and uh, that just is a uh, reality. Now, uh, in his paper, Professor Huang also advocates that Taiwan would be better off if the institution of the National Security Council was stronger. And I certainly agree with that. Uh, I think there, that uh, countries that have a well-established uh, policy-making process uh, can help leaders make uh, decisions that reduce risk and uh, lead to better results. The reality in Taiwan, however, has been that Taiwan has had three very strong-minded presidents. And that even if the National Security Council as an institution were to be strengthened, it would only uh, be effective if the gentlemen or women who become the future presidents of China were willing uh, to subordinate their strong personalities and decision-making styles to a process of uh, bureaucratic uh, decision-making. And that is not part of the political culture of Taiwan that we have seen uh, up to now. I would certainly think Taiwan would be better off with more of it, but one has to deal with reality as you find it. Finally, I have one other question of interest that I think might contribute to helping explain what role the NSC uh, has played and could play in the future. And that has to do with the fact that in Taiwan there is always a transition period between the election of a new president and his assumption of office. Uh, this is a period of three or four months, much like we have in the United States, uh, quite unlike uh, the experience in Japan and other parliamentary democracies where there is no such transition period. But in Taiwan, you have that built into the political structure. So if uh, a pattern 
could develop in Taiwan where the incoming administration and the outgoing administration uh, could have transition teams work closely with the NSC, uh, I think this uh, would be very helpful. In making uh, this comment, I would say that it's probably also unlikely that this is going to happen because of how bitterly divided the parties uh, in Taiwan are and the lack of trust that goes across uh, the green-blue spectrum. But nevertheless, uh, I do recall that when Chen Shui-bian came to office, uh, you did have some members of the outgoing administration who had been in the United States and understood the role that transition, uh, transition cooperation between an outgoing administration and an incoming administration can be helpful to the incoming administration. I'm thinking here particularly of uh, Cheng Jinren, who was the foreign minister at that time, who went out of his way to brief uh, the people that Chun had uh, formed. And I think more of this would be helpful, but it, refl it only is going to come about if there is a sort of shift in the political culture on Taiwan in the direction of recognizing that these kinds of informal arrangements, which cannot be written into law, can only come about as a result of habits of political activity within a society uh, are adapted. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a very succinct summary and, and a, uh, pre the presentation of very good questions. Um, I'm looking forward to the answers coming from Dr. Wan. Um, let's now move on to the second pre presentation uh, by Yasuhiro Matsuda-sensei, please. Uh, thank you, Takahara-san, and uh, thank you again, Bonnie. And, uh, uh, before I uh, get into my own topic, I uh, have to answer the question uh, about uh, the relationship between the, the collective self-defense uh, right and uh, Taiwan, because uh, Takara-san assigned to me. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have to say that what I'm going to say is not interesting at all. Uh, it does not deserve to be posted on the front page of the Taiwanese newspapers. So please relax <laughs> and forget it <laughs> quickly. Okay? Um, uh, the lifting the ban of the uh, collective self-defense right in Japan uh, was uh, just recently uh, uh, decided by the, uh, the Abe cabinet. And uh, the legis legislation process will have to follow. But uh, based on the political calculation, because uh, Japan will have uh, local elections next year, uh, early next year, and this uh, agenda is not welcomed by the public. So uh, Abe cabinet decided to postpone the legislative uh, process to next year. Uh, uh, so the, the concrete uh, 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 possible actions or behavior uh, uh, toward the, the, the uh, you know, uh, Taiwan contingency is still unclear. So my uh, uh, brief answer is, I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, there are uh, three things I can say. First, you know, the collective self-defense uh, right is adapted uh, to state state-to-state -state relationship. Taiwan is not a state in the uh, Japanese legal uh, system. Taiwan is not a state. So uh, theoretically, in international law, you know, uh, Taiwan is not uh, uh, the, the, the object uh, to be uh, for, for using the, the uh, exercising the collective self-defense force. The second. Uh, uh, Japan's uh, role to defend U.S. Uh, military in the case of, uh, in cases of contingencies near Japan, Japan can defend U.S. forces, right? Uh, then, uh, in that, uh, you know, uh, situation, the uh, U.S.-Japan uh, alliance will be largely enhanced, and Taiwan's security. Uh, is dependent on U.S.-Japan security alliance. 
So it naturally, uh, you know, makes uh, a kind of effect. But what is the concrete effect? That is still uh, very early to say. You know, we have to wait until next year. And the third uh, one thing is that the lifting uh, of this right is not an all-out lifting. It's a very limited lifting. So a lot of Japanese uh, security specialists are dissatisfied by the, uh, the decision by uh, the Abe cabinet. You know, uh, when uh, the one country which is very close uh, uh, with uh, Japan is attacked by somebody else, uh, that attack is wrong and imminent and no other option, there are no other options, and Japan can take minimum needed uh, actions. That's, that's very, very limited. And the, 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 and the purpose of uh, you, uh, exercising this collective self-defense is to defend Japan. The, the, this, the, these discourses are very much limited. So, um, I don't know. So, as I said, it's not interesting at all. <laughs> okay, let's uh, get into the, uh, my... Uh, Another very in interesting presentation. Uh, yes, yeah, the, this presentation is going to be very interesting. Okay, let's start. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Shut off that microphone, please. Okay, Thank sure. you. Yeah. Uh, uh, next, uh, my my uh, presentation uh, topic is cross-strait relations and the Mainjo administration from economic to political dependence, question mark. Please, next. Um, I uh, introduced uh, the project of my a, a team uh, earlier. Uh, the key word is actually uh, this, uh, the dilemma between prosperity and self-reliance in Taiwan. If uh, Taiwan pursues uh, prosperity, you know, Taiwan has to uh, be dependent on China to some, to some extent. If Japan, uh, yes, I'm sorry, if Taiwan, actually Japan is the same. <laughs> if Taiwan seeks, uh, the, you know, uh, the independence uh, and self-reliance, uh, then it has to uh, sacrifice uh, the prosperity uh, to some extent. So this is a dilemma. And Taiwan is a relatively small economy, an outward, out, uh, outwarded economy, and uh, there are interactions, economic interactions with um, the mainland China is so important. And the uh, Chen administration uh, allowed being uh, dependent on China economically, and on the other hand, uh, it uh, tried to seek uh, independence, uh, political independence from China. And uh, that was uh, denied, that policy line was denied uh, by the public, and uh, the uh, party alternation occurred. And the Mao administration uh, began to promote uh, 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 institutionalization. But my question is, uh, is that going to uh, lead a political uh, de de uh, dependency uh, as well? Um, uh, and this uh, is uh, going to be a, a very interesting, the, the answer is going to be a very interesting implication for the post ma administration uh, after uh, 2016. Next, please. Figure one shows that the uh, Taiwan's uh, economic dependence on China has heightened uh, during the, uh, surprisingly, uh, Chen Shui-bian's administration period from two, 2000 to 2008, around 2010. You know, the dependence is you know, really, really uh, uh, high. And, uh, uh, but still, uh, the relations between the Taiwan and uh, the mainland China was not institutionalized. So. It was a very uh, unstable relationship. Next, please. So uh, the uh, Ma intro administration uh, uh, hammered out a series of new policies, and that was based on 1992 consensus. You know, it takes time to, to, to understand 1992. What is 1992 consensus? Because the definitions are different for different parties. Uh, Taiwan has its own version. The mainland China has its own version. But it is a consensus mentioning one China. Uh, so this, is, this can be uh, called uh, one China magic. You know, based on this magic, you know, both sides uh, can uh, proceed uh, the relationship. Uh, they promoted a lot of uh, items. 
And uh, Ma Incheo also uh, uh, stated uh, its status quo orientation. No unification, no independence, no use of force. And not only uh, these words, these words, you know, he set up uh, the KMT uh, CPC platform. You know, that's for political you know, uh, negotiation or political communication. And also in the working level, uh, he uh, revi uh, re uh, resumed uh, SCF ARAT's platform. And he welcomed, uh, you know, tourists from the mainland China. You know, it's, it's three million every year. It's a huge number. And he also uh, promoted diplomatic truce. You know, don't fight over uh, uh, picking up the, 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 the diplomatic relations with uh, China or uh, China, uh, between China and Taiwan. And also, he, he promoted uh, a lot of efforts to have FDA with other nations. Next, please. In response with uh, President Ma's uh, uh, policies, new policies, Hu Jintao also uh, released uh, so-called six points. And uh, I'd like to read this. If mainland China and Taiwan were to reach an economic agreement, it would also be beneficial for Taiwan to enter the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Mechanism, which includes the United States. So TPP is also uh, theoretically included. A positive response to the diplomatic truce, which would mean an end to China's use of diplomatic aid as a way to convince other countries to, to not uh, recognize Taiwan. It also suggests that China is willing to recognize Taiwan's activists involving international organizations to some extent, which is assumption that there will be no compromise regarding sovereignty. Okay. Uh, a strong intention to reach a, a peace accord under the One China Principle. So the, these are the, uh, the contents of the Hu Jintao Six Point. Next, please. The result is a, a, a remarkable outcome. You know, the, the, there are were, there have been 21 agreements between uh, CAF and ARATS, and uh, they signed uh, ECFA. And under ECFA uh, framework, uh, they uh, can promote a lot of trade and investment, and uh, because welcoming uh, the the tourism uh, from the mainland China, the, there is a, comp a comprehensive social interactions. And in international area as well, uh, Taiwan has made uh, a limited uh, achievement. For example, uh, uh, participating into the Beijing Olympic game with Zhonghua Taipei, uh, which is totally uh, impossible to understand for only English speakers. Uh, what is the difference between Zhongguo Taipei and uh, Zhonghua Taipei? Those are all Chinese Taipei, but anyway, that's that means, you know, <laughs> that important for uh, Chinese uh, living, uh, uh, you know, world. So, uh, you know, that's a, a small step uh, for, uh, but still a, a big step for, forward. And participation of Taiwanese uh, representatives at the annual meeting of the uh, IKO and WHO and uh, FDA with New Zealand and uh, Singapore and Japan and Taiwan uh, signed a uh, fishery agreement. These are a remarkable achievement, okay? But what happened uh, 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 based on the, these uh, policy changes and uh, the social changes, and please look at this. The blue line uh, implies that, uh, uh, reveals that Taiwan is tra travelers to China. Taiwanese travelers to China were quite limited. Uh, you know, the, there are, are repeaters, you know, the businessmen, and, and uh, there are some, uh, you know, uh, tourists, but uh, businessmen uh, were uh, the majority. So it's, it's more than uh, uh, five million people uh, now, but uh, the Thai uh, Chinese travelers to Taiwan was relatively so small number, and the change started in 2008, and now it's around three million people are visiting uh, Taiwan every year. That's a huge uh, you know, change. You know, so if you go to Taipei, you can hear uh, uh, Mandarin accent, you know, uh, mainland accent of uh, Mandarin. Next, please. Interesting thing is that as the interaction, social interaction grows, the Taiwanese uh, identity also grows. Uh, please look at this uh, chart. Uh, the, those who uh, think that they're Taiwanese, not Chinese, 
began to grow around 2008. You know, there may be an interaction between you know, two phenomena, but there may be, uh, th this may be a, a coincidence, right? Then let's, let's uh, take a look at another chart. Next, please. Uh, this is also a very uh, uh, um, uh, famous uh, chart. Uh, asking that uh, which do you prefer, uh, status quo, independence, or unification of Taiwan. Uh, recent uh, change is unclear by this chart. You know, uh, the, 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 the highest uh, figure is maintaining, okay, maintaining the status quo, right? Uh, decide later. Uh, and uh, the status quo indefinitely, and uh, then unification as soon as possible. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, status quo now, independence later. These are uh, 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 the, in the category of the uh, pro status quo pe people. But you know, people could be intimidated if you if someone tells you that uh, we'll we'll see the change of status quo tom tomorrow, and there will be a war or something. So actually, this uh, is not a good example. Next, please. So if you remove the question of status quo, asking the status quo, there are, there, is only, there are only two choices, independence or unification. Look at this. Uh, look at blue line. Uh, the people, those who support independence, you know, increased. And those who support uh, unification decreased, and those who have no opinion also decreased. So uh, this means that you know identity and uh, uh, independence orientation also uh, increased as well. The problem is that the cross-strait interaction and uh, the the grow uh, growth of the Taiwanese identity and uh, pro uh, independence orientation. Uh, whether they have, in, you know, cause and effect relations or not. Next, please. And then uh, there is a, a Taiwanese uh, political scientist, uh, Lin, Lin Chun Tu. Uh, she uh, made a remarkable uh, study, uh, empirical study, uh, from 2004 to 2008. Uh, the result is this. Until 2008, the only Taiwanese people who visited men in China were those who transferred uh, there by their comp uh, companies or those who had a high level of income or education and could afford to travel to a foreign country, quote unquote. However, it is possible that Taiwanese people from all social classes, uh, even those uh, with low levels of in education, have had more contact with Chinese visitors to Taiwan as travelers between the two has uh, increased. Uh, for Taiwanese people, this uh, contact has hi uh, highlighted uh, the differences between them and the visitors from mainland China and stirred uh, their Taiwanese identity. If uh, the hypothesis, this hypothesis holds that people with experience with the mainland China have identities uh, that are not easily swayed, uh, the trend toward increasing Taiwanese self-identity is irreversible. This is uh, very bad news for China. Uh, very bad news for China. You know, they, they didn't expect uh, that after the, uh, the, the increase of the, uh, the, you know, the cross-strait uh, interaction, this kind of phenomenon happens. Please. So the, the policy or, uh, uh, or a political uh, choice uh, for uh, Taiwanese government is very, very difficult. Uh, the Mainjo's approach uh, started from the easier one uh, and uh, stepping toward uh, the, the less easier one, from the shallow water to the deep water. Uh, the category C uh, is a relatively uh, uh, easier uh, one, such as uh, welcoming uh, you know, uh, Chinese tourism or uh, uh, diplomatic truce. You know, it can be done uh, unilaterally, and China just, uh, do, do, just doing nothing, then they can enjoy diplomatic truce. And uh, participation of, uh, of the, uh, Taiwan's participation of the NGOs and so on. These are easy things. And now my NGO uh, administration is struggling in the difficult ones, relatively difficult ones in the category B. 
uh, that's called in deep water. And if, if, if he gets into the category A, the change of the status quo of the legal status quo of the, uh, the cross regulations and so on, that's not, not deep water, even not a deep water. It's a black hole. You know, it's uh, it's Im important uh, to survive uh, for, for Taiwanese uh, people. So th these are, you know, level of difficulties. But, but please, uh, uh, the next please. But, yeah, almost done. Yes, I'm almost done. Uh, my NGO's approval rating is very low. Uh, disapproval uh, uh, rating is very high, more than 70%. And approval rating is less than, almost almost 10% or so. In this situation, my NGO uh, surprisingly chose to get into the, uh, close to the black hole, you know, the deeper uh, water. Next, please. He has made uh, numerous efforts to uh, Marshi summit meeting. Uh, it uh, started next uh, last year. Uh, he uh, uh, hammered out a new uh, words uh, like one China framework. Yes, yes, I, I will wrap up very quickly. Uh, one China framework and uh, uh, three no's, which is almost the same as uh, what China wants, and so on. So uh, uh, there was a huge repercussion from the Taiwanese society. Next, please. That is sunflower movement, uh, which we witnessed in last, uh, uh, you know, March uh, through uh, April time. There are uh, many, many oppositions against Ma uh, he, he, has, he is an, very unpopular now, but he uh, tries to promote uh, a meeting, summit meeting with uh, Xi Jinping. So this structure, uh, as long as this structure exists, I think that anyone who takes uh, 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 leadership after 2016 will have a very difficult time, very difficult time. Dilemma between prosperity and self-reliance will uh, further uh, be uh, deepened. Next, please. So my intro, uh, these are my conclusions. My intro administration's conciliatory policies toward China uh, promoted the stabiliza uh, stabilization and institutionalization of, of the relations. Yes, that's right. Uh, and, but China has not compromised its core principles with regard to Taiwan, with regard to uh, its uh, sovereignty. Taiwan's self-identity has grown due to increased social contacts between the, uh, the, the peoples of mainland China. Economic changes inevitably cause political changes, and economic de dependence can create political dependence. Uh, the results of the policy shift from, uh, of the Ma Yinjiu administration have made a summit meeting in Beijing and Taipei a possibility, just a possibility. And lastly, opposition against political dependence on China in the Taiwanese public is extremely strong, and it will uh, uh, change the color uh, after 2016. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matsuda-san, for a very uh, clear presentation. And thanks also for answering the question that was carried over from the previous session. Um, I think we are a bit pressed with time. So without further ado, uh, discussion is Morning Laser, who doesn't need any introduction. Please, Morning. Well, this was a, a terrific paper uh, by Matsuda-sensei. Uh, a very good analysis of developments in cross-strait relations. Uh, and I had mostly questions. Uh, that came to mind after reading his analysis. Uh, what will be the direction of cross-strait relations in the future? What will be the implications for Japan, uh, for the United States? Will there be a complete convergence between the U.S. and Japan in our interests and in our reactions, uh, depending on that variable of how cross-strait relations developed? So certainly President Ma ying has achieved a great deal. The easy things have been uh, accomplished and the hard things remain. So I would say even if the KMT remains in power after 2016, cross-strait relations will not be easy. If the DPP returns to power, then there will be even greater uncertainty. So far, uh, the only point of agreement, I think, in the DPP is that policy toward the mainland should be based on a consensus in Taiwan. Uh, a process has been created that uh, is vetting ideas within the party, uh, but so far, 
that process has not yielded uh, any new policy proposals. Importantly, the DPP has not adopted a clear stance on one China, and, and it may not. Uh, but this is Beijing's bottom line, nonetheless. Uh, there is, I think, no consensus, for example, on whether to freeze uh, the Taiwan independence plank uh, in the 1991 party platform. Now, Matsuda Sensei points out that China has left the door open to reversing course in the future, presumably if a future government in Taiwan does not act in accordance with uh, Beijing's wishes. Now, that is more likely if uh, there is a strongly pro-independence uh, government in power. Uh, but there's also the possibility that economic pressure uh, could be used if China becomes impatient uh, for political progress. So Matsuda-san discusses Taiwan's reliance on mainland China economically and the vulnerability that arises uh, from this dependence. China, indeed, has used so far economic incentives toward Taiwan. And those incentives, under certain circumstances, could be turned into punitive measures. And we have seen China use economic uh, pressure and coercion uh, against some of its neighbors, uh, particularly against Japan uh, and uh, the Philippines uh, more recently in, uh, in 2012. Uh, Matsuda-san notes the example of uh, tourists could be limited uh, that are sent uh, or permitted to go uh, to Taiwan. And uh, uh, Matsuda-san also says China could use its leverage to make political demands. But I think we do have to draw a distinction between deterring independence and compelling unification. Indeed, it is probably easier uh, to deter independence, and mainland pressure to deter independence has worked to some extent. But the mainland has not been successful so far in compelling Taiwan to re reunify. Um, or compelling the Taiwan people to support reunification. And this is evidenced in the data that uh, Matsuda-san presented on self-identity, which has strengthened on the islands. Now, many American observers have been expressing concerns about Taiwan's growing economic dependence on mainland China. About 40% of Taiwan's exports uh, go to the mainland. This is not new. This has been true for a number of years. Um, and about 80% of Taiwan's overall outward investment goes to the mainland. Um, our former Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, raised this concern very explicitly in an interview uh, this past June. And she warned Taiwan of the linkage between economic independence and political independence, citing the fate that Ukraine suffered at the hands of Russia. Now, what can Japan and the US do in this regard? Is there a role for our two countries to play? And I would certainly put on the table that we should be doing uh, as much as we can to s promote Taiwan's participation in the regional economic integration process, although Taiwan has its own homework to do in that regard, too. Um, there was a question that was raised in the first panel that I would like to uh, pose to, uh, uh, to Professor uh, Matsuda. Is Japan worried about closer mainland China-Taiwan ties? What are the specific developments between the two sides of the strait that might be viewed as harmful uh, to Japanese interests. And again, is there a, do you see a convergence between the US and Japan on this point or a potential divergence? And then the last point that I'd like to make is about international space. It's probably only one piece of your analysis that I uh, somewhat disagree with. I think that you are more sanguine about China's willingness to provide Taiwan with greater international space than I am. Uh, this is a subject I've done a great deal of work on over the past year. Uh, last year, we published a report on uh, Taiwan's international space that included uh, an examination of China's policy. And we will be publishing uh, yet another one later this year, specifically on Taiwan's role in international security uh, organizations and uh, groupings and, and regional mechanisms. Um, I think that uh, Beijing is holding hostage its support for allowing Taiwan to sign additional FTAs with other nations uh, to the ratification of the TISA agreement um, by uh, Taiwan's legislative UN. And indeed, recently, China's ambassador to Malaysia very explicitly and publicly said that Beijing would oppose an FTA between Malaysia and Taiwan. Now, 
if he is simply opposing uh, the name free trade agreement, then that won't be an issue because that's not the name that was used in Taiwan's agreement with uh, Singapore or with New Zealand. But the question remains, is China opposing new free trade type agreements between Taiwan and other nations? You mentioned um, ICAO. This is, of course, the second UN-affiliated organization uh, that uh, the mainland has allowed Taiwan to play a role in. Um, I raise the possibility that this is a one-off deal. Uh, by the way, this was not an annual meeting that uh, Taiwan participated in. It's held once every three years. It's a general meeting. Uh, there is a uh, council uh, that Taiwan might apply to be an observer to that holds four times a year, holds meetings four times a year. There are many technical meetings. Taiwan is not included in any of these. Um, so I would say really, um, I'm not sure that, that problem has been resolved. Uh, the WHA example, I think, is a better example, and maybe the only really good example of the mainland allowing Taiwan greater international space. Of course, under the great, uh, under, against the background of the SARS epidemic that broke out in 2003. Even in NGOs, China has tried to, cons to constrain Taiwan's participation in the international community, or has tried to change the name of Taipei's delegation from Chinese Taipei to uh, you know, uh, Taiwan, China. So um, I would say China views Taiwan's uh, participation in international organizations as a political issue that must be addressed through political talks, which President Ma is as yet unwilling uh, to undertake. And so I see this as a big question mark uh, going forward. Uh, so uh, I will close my comments with that and uh, look forward to your responses. Thank you. Thank you for, once again, very in intriguing questions. Um, so now I would like uh, two presenters to uh, provide um, the response to the questions and comments being raised by the discussants. Uh, Dr. Wan, first, please. Maybe I cannot do best answer by English, but I try to do it. Mm. The most research about mainland policy decision making always focus on personal network with USA and China, or focus on the personal qual quality about the leader. But mm, I think this uh, situation is um, the co the cost by the um, government institute is too many problem uh, of ambiguous inter organizational relations, and this is not a um, illegal government; it's human govern governance. So. Um, but NSC is the most important ch channel for president to make decision. And um, my concept about the decision-making process it, is that institution is important and how to use the institution is also important. And the ins if the institution ha has too many prob problems of ambiguous Interorganizational uh, relations. We should uh, the um, gov the administration operation is depend on the president president's qu quality or staffs in um, staffs uh, quality and need some human personal network to do the decision making. I think this is not a good institution, so I try to study the, the institution, institution about the mainland policy decision making. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bonnie, for uh, giving me such an uh, uh, important uh, questions. Uh, Yes, um, I would like to uh, talk about uh, Japan, Japan's uh, various views 
uh, on the, the, the close relations between uh, the mainland and China and Taiwan. Uh, this is a very sensitive issue, you know. Uh, this is a triangle relationship. So uh, I have to be very careful. And uh, I uh, tend to uh, use this way of explanation. There are three different national interests uh, for Japan over the cross-trade relations. One is uh, crisis management, so no war. You know, that's, that's the first national interest. The second is power balance in this region. And the third uh, national interest is economic interest. Uh, comparing uh, Chen Shui-pian administration and uh, Ma ying administration, I think that in the first category, uh, the crisis management, I think Ma ying uh, is much more comfortable uh, for, for Japan because it doesn't seem like uh, war, war, war is happening. Uh, so, as in terms of the stability, you know, the, 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 uh, the close and stable cross-trade relationship is Japan's national interest. But in the second category, the power balance, if you talk about the power balance in this region, I think that there are a lot of Japanese who are really worried about whether Taiwan is, you know, leaning toward uh, China or not. And uh, some uh, extreme uh, people think that Taiwan is over. It's, it's already over, uh, something like this. Or we don't need Taiwan or something. Anyway, uh, some uh, people uh, may say that way. So in terms of power balance, I think that close and stable relations, or even much more, for example, much more uh, extreme case, unification. That's, that's a nightmare for some Japanese people who uh, extremely care about the power balance of this region. Uh, but in the, th so, uh, uh, so uh, in, in, in this meaning, uh, the Chen shui administration was much more comfortable for, for Japan. But in the third category, economic interest, I think Japan uh, is enjoying my NGO's new policy. Uh, because it's much more stable, stay much stabler and much more institutionalized. And there are many, many uh, cases of Japan Taiwan, uh, Taiwan alliance to, uh, to do investment on China. There are you know, a lot of uh, cases, and we, uh, one of uh, our team, uh, one, one member of our uh, team uh, is doing this kind of research. And this, this is really remarkable. Uh, result. And uh, so Japan's views on close and uh, stable relations between uh, mainland China and Taiwan is different for different people or different for different national interests. Uh, it's like a, a, a university professor's, you know, <laughs> uh, answer. But anyway, this is, it's not interesting, but, but please <laughs> forgive me. Uh, and the second uh, uh, question, uh, you're, yeah, yes, you're right. And uh, whether China allows uh, much more wider international space uh, for Taiwan is a bit questionable, yes. I think that the situation become much more uh, subtler than before. Uh, during the Chen shui period, any uh, act to, to promote or cultivate international space for Taiwan was blocked by China by any means. But in Ma ying era, because the relations between the, 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 the two parties are good, so it is not politically correct to block Taiwan's effort to cultivate international uh, space every time in a very uh, seeable way. You know, because it will uh, invoke, provoke uh, pan-green people and the DPP, and they may become much more powerful in uh, Taiwan. So China is playing a very subtle game, much subtler game than before. Well, that's my explanation. For example, uh, you know, the, the Chinese ambassador to Malaysia publicly opposed 
uh, the, the possible FDA be between uh, Taiwan and Malaysia. Uh, he's, he's not politically incorrect. He's politically correct, but maybe slightly different from uh, China's policy toward uh, Taiwan. But uh, since he is not politically incorrect, he will not be punished. That, 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 that happens everywhere. <laughs> In, you know, the, the Chinese, Chinese political figures can smash Japan publicly. That, that may be a bit different, uh, different from China's present policy toward uh, Japan, but it, it, that action is politically correct. So he, uh, that, that person will not be punished. So this, this kind of, I, I think this kind of a deviation of the national policy uh, from the national policy. And this kind of thing uh, happen uh, sometimes. So, uh, yes, you're right, but um, uh, there, are, there are much subtler uh, changes. And especially in terms of the bilateral uh, economic agreements. For example, there is a, a hidden uh, rule, qian gui zi, hidden rule. <laughs> uh, if China hasn't uh, signed an, an FDA or other economic agreement with uh, a certain country, Taiwan cannot sign an agreement with that country. That's a hidden like rule. Like Japan or India. Yeah, like Japan or India. But Japan signed uh, uh, investment protection uh, agreement with Taiwan before China. And China, I think China uh, was really upset inside the country, but didn't, you know, explode it. Because, you know, if China does so, it will, you know, uh, help DPP to criticize my NGO and criticize my NGO's uh, main and policy. So it's, the situation is very subtle now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now the floor is open, so please raise your hands for questions. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Joanne Chen from Taipei Academic Seneca. I appreciate uh, Professor... Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Your comment and also uh, Bonnie's comment. You mentioned there are three levels of Japanese national interest. The third level looks like the lowest level economic policy, economic interest. But I remember Secretary of State uh, Kerry mentioned several times repeatedly, he says, foreign policy is economic policy. Economic policy is foreign policy. So Taiwan's overdependence on one single market, the Chinese market, looks like it's uh, economic policy, but actually it's foreign policy. It has strategic implication. For the time being, there are 21 agreements signed between Cross Strait, but if Taiwan's continuing depend on Chinese market, I think Taiwan's negotiating and bargaining leverage will be less and less. So Bonnie mentioned about the US role and Japanese role to help Taiwan, to bring Taiwan out of this economic isolation, I think should have more uh, important element in the future. Uh, I think Taiwan's over-dependence on uh, China market should be considered by the U.S., Japanese, as well as all the Asian country. Taiwan is now interested in joining TPP, RCEP. So even if we continue to depend on Chinese market, there's no warranty and guarantee Taiwan will continue enjoy the prosperity because China is now engaging more FTA, for example, Hopefully, China would like to uh, reach agreement uh, with South Korea. So no warranty Taiwan will continue to prosper. So if we consider this as a strategic issue in Taiwan, of course, we have our own homework, as Bonnie mentioned. So we have to do more consensus, and we have to reform our uh, systems to accommodate to open more markets. I'm sorry, Joanne, so that's we it. really low Thank on you. time. You don't have a question? Fine. No. Just comment. All right, thank you. Next, next person, please. Here we go. Can you, someone bring the microphone to this lady? Thank you. 
Hi, uh, Nadia Chow from Liberty Times. I have a question for a professor, both of you from Japan. Uh, I remember in the past, you know, uh, Japan's policy toward Taiwan was strictly, I uh, wouldn't say dominate, but uh, strictly um, steered by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and bureaucrats. Um, people always said that there's no flexibility uh, in, uh, in your bureaucrat. bureaucrat. But, but we, we see, see that recently, recently uh, uh, the, the, the relationship has changed. Some people even uh, comment that the fishery agreement between Taiwan and Japan uh, was dr uh, was driven by Abe himself. So is there a change in Japan's politics? I mean, the politician has now more room to manu maneuver the foreign relationship or the relationship with the Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you. Let's collect some more. Yes, the gentleman at the back there. Scott Harold from RAND. I have a question for Dr. Matsuda and also Bonnie if you want to answer. Uh, um, I wonder if you could comment on the impact of the Senkaku's challenge that China is posing to Japan for the possibility of uh, Japan's relationship with Taiwan. In other words, after 2016, if the DPP were to come back to office and China were to decide to reverse what it has been doing, which has been kind of downgrading the pressure it's putting on Japan on the Senkaku's, if they were to ramp back up or even take the Senkaku's physically away from Japan, occupy them, would that carry implications for Japan recognizing Taipei? And if not, or if so, does that carry impl any implications for deterring China from trying to take the Senkakus away from Japan? Thanks. The possibility of a DPP comeback is a big question. <laughs> Here we go. Let's take one more, and then I'll ask you to respond. Hi, um, thank you for all the presentations. Uh, especially thank you, Professor Matsuda, for uh, taking the questions from the last panel. Uh, that's a very, very interesting answer, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, I have a question directed, uh, well, mostly to Prof also Professor Matsuda, or if Ms. Glazer would like to answer it. Um, what is the signal that's been sent out by the Sunflower Movement that, that uh, Professor Matsuda has uh, showed in his presentation to the international society uh, about the directions that Taiwan is moving. Because uh, I know a lot of commentators, on, uh, especially talking about uh, some of the movements, saying that Taiwan is moving on the, uh, after this movement. Well, Taiwan is having that kind of uh, sinophobia, or whatever <laughs> that is called, sort of afraid of China, so that this kind of movement is held. Um, but it also has an implication, I think, personally, I think it, there has an implication on Taiwan is not actually moving that close to China. It was trying to separate from China, albeit the uh, economic dependence. So um, my question is what, yeah, so what, what kind of uh, symbolic meaning did uh, the Sampla movement had show to the world, and um, especially to the scholars or specialists? I have a professional on this issue. Thank you. Right, thank you for all the stimulating questions. I'll uh, first ask the presenters to respond, and I'm sure the discussants would uh, like to respond to some of them, so I'll give some time for Mr. Brown and uh, Bonnie. Uh, which one would you like to go? Matsuda san, would you like to go first? Thank you. Uh, thank you for many precious questions. Uh, the first question is that uh, is the decision making uh, of foreign policy in Japan uh, are politician-led, more and more politician-led? The answer is yes. Uh, you know, the, the Prime Minister Abe posted uh, his uh, picture uh, taken with uh, uh, Vincent Xiao uh, uh, when uh, the APEC meeting was uh, held last year in his Facebook. And uh, uh, that was very popular and unprecedented unprecedented situation. In the past, the, all those uh, Japan-Taiwan interactions are very, very uh, low-key, uh, don't open up, but this time is quite different. I think that there are uh, uh, you know, uh, initiative uh, driven by uh, Prime Minister Abe. There, there is uh, uh, initiative. And uh, not only Taiwan policy of Japan, but uh, the other uh, fields as well. You know, Japan is now facing a, a tremendous uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, change of uh, society and the, uh, the political leadership is uh, more and more important uh, as a whole. 
Uh, the second question is, that's a very provocative question. Thank you, Harold. <laughs> and uh, uh, my answer is, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the, because th those two questions are separate questions, uh, whether to uh, you know, uh, recognize Taiwan or not, or, or, or how, how to deal with uh, the uh, Senka contingency are, are different things. That it might be connected, but it's uh, far beyond my imagination so far. I'm sorry, I, I don't know. The third question, the uh, Sunflower Movement is a very uh, interesting movement, and it is still very early for us to, to, to draw, a, draw a conclusion about that. And, but maybe the much more universal, not only uh, specifically uh, uh, Taiwan-oriented, uh, but the much more uh, uh, universal uh, implication is that this is one of the reactions uh, to the way of the rise of China. Uh, for the people uh, surrounding uh, in China. Even the people in Hong Kong are now, uh, you know, protesting against uh, China's uh, uh, so-called uh, election uh, package. That's, that's, that's not an election you know, for, for our standard, but, but anyway. Uh, Japan, Vietnam, and the Philippines, and even Malaysia, there, there are some uh, repercussions against China. Uh, uh, it's rising. So I think that this is a kind of wake-up call uh, for China to review its policy, you know, but actually, uh, this may be politically incorrect, you know, but Beijing's policy toward Tibet and uh, the, the Xinjiang are also have to be you know, reviewed. It's not it, China's foreign policy, but you know, Beijing's policy uh, toward uh, you know, these people uh, should be uh, seriously reviewed. That's uh, uh, my uh, version of uh, the implication uh, to the uh, to the world. Uh, thank you. Do you have any? I think this is a difficult um, question, but I Sunflower. think I think um, there is an important message in sunflower student <coughs> movement um, that when the government want to promote the policy about the um, free trend. They should do the best communication with all um, in industries and all people. Um, if they cannot do it, maybe there is um, some um, protest movement um, happen in everywhere. Thank you. Mr. Brown, I'm sorry, the time is limited. Uh, just one word on the Sunflower Student Movement. I think uh, one of the important questions is whether this was a one-off event uh, reflecting attitudes of a certain segment of Taiwan society at one point in time, or is this going to have some uh, staying power? And I think that depends to a large extent on how successful uh, the student leaders are in continuing their activities and mobilizing public support behind uh, various uh, activities they conduct. And that, on that question, I think the answer is far from clear at this point. Thank you. Bon. I'd like to just add one brief thing uh, about the Sunflower Movement. I think it's very important to try to understand uh, the causes uh, in Taiwan, the concerns in Taiwan. Uh, it's very difficult to separate out the many factors that are shaping the attitudes of young people, uh, especially since uh, mainland China is related to all of them. Uh, but if young people are having difficulty getting a job, mainland China is one of the factors, but there are also others. Uh, so I think it's really difficult to tease out. But what I'm really interested in is how the mainland perceives the sunflower movement. And I think at the beginning, there was really no understanding, um, and there was a knee-jerk uh, reaction to see this as being driven uh, by the DPP. Uh, the question, I think, after examining this sunflower movement for some time, 
Uh, now, and I have talked to different analysts and officials uh, in China about this. There are really, uh, I think, two different interpretations. One is that sees the roots of it, uh, that China has some uh, it, in China's responsibility to some extent in how it has treated uh, Taiwan. Uh, but there is another view that it is really the de movement in Taiwan that is primarily responsible for shaping the attitudes of uh, the students who are involved in the Sunflower Movement and those who support them. That latter view really absolves the mainland of really sort of any responsibility. It's all the fault of Taiwan's government. Um, and it's the Taiwan government that has to change its designification movement. Um, so I think that this is something really interesting to watch going forward. Well, thank you so much for all the comments and questions. Um, one word on the sunflower movement for me. I do research into China, and I sense that um, you know, besides all these issues in cross-strait relations, uh, I did sense this common, um, what's the word, uh, anxiety and dissatisfaction that is shared amongst the young people, not only in Taiwan, but in mainland China and in Japan as, as well. So uh, if the uh, insight of the Chinese leadership was deep enough, it, they, they would sense that it's, it may come to mainland China. And that's, that's a very dangerous situation uh, for, for them. Um, sorry about the extra <laughs> intervention from me. Um, but uh, I hope you had a, a good time. And thank you very much uh, to Bonnie again and to uh, David, and please join me in thanking all the presenters and the discussants on the panel. Thank you very much.